ahead. Start over. Hello, hello, <laughs> and hello. We are so happy that you are joining us and thank you for being a part of the Empathy in Tech community. Yay, see those happy hands. Our goal with the Empathy in Tech community is to make content like this accessible. We want to remove barriers so anyone can learn and engage in the conversation around empathy being a technical skill. If you are interested in empathy and interested in technology, you are welcome here. It doesn't matter if you have 20 years of experience or if you just got interested in the topic, everyone is welcome and you and me can bring important ideas to this conversation. I'm Nyota Gordon, an adaptability coach, TEDx speaker, corporate trainer, and retiree from the Army. Yes, only the Army, uh, with a background in cybersecurity and over 25 years of tech experience. I am part of the Empathy and Tech Leadership Team, along with today's presenter, Andrea Goulet, Katie Wormeyer, and um, our one cohort, or uh, co-lover person, uh, Katie, uh, Casey, and he's missing today, but he is with us in spirits. Um, today's workshop, Communication Strategies for Technical Content, is presented by Empathy and Tech founder, Andrea Goulet. Andrea is on a mission to optimize, operationalize empathy for technologists and is the author of Empathy Driven Software Development, coming out early next year. Coming out early next year. It might be late next year, just as a heads up. I met with my editor recently. So. Um, and, well, but it's coming out. So it just is. make sure you're on the email yes. list. You must be on the email list if you're getting this so you can get the, those amazing updates. Um, and this engaging presentation. This one isn't just a presentation. This one is a workshop. Um, Andrea will teach specific and immediately actionable techniques for communicating highly technical information in plain language. Thank you. Thank you. Instead of dumbing things down, you'll learn frameworks that will help you tailor your message for different audiences while still conveying concepts accurately. Can we give snaps for that? Um, and there are a few things to note. Today's event is being recorded. If you would like to stay anonymous, feel free to keep your video off, um, adjust your name, and we'll be on monitoring the chat for any questions that may come up there. Like we said, the, the breakout rooms will not be recorded. And also um, have closed captioning turned on so the text is adjustable in size. Just look for the live transcript button in your toolbar, wherever yours is. And the workshop will be an hour and a half, 30 minutes for a presentation, 30, and these are about, so don't, pull out your timer. Don't be like that. Just, just about 30 minutes for presentation, about 30 minutes to practice in small groups in the breakout rooms, and about 30 minutes to share and wrap up. Okay. Um, the breakout rooms will be small groups with the same people for 30 minutes where you can practice actually take this away with you, put it in your pocket and use it um, in your everyday lives that you can you can practice what you learn and Andra will be popping in to each group to provide feedback. All right, isn't that awesome? And with that, may I introduce the amazing, wonderful, caring, beautiful, awesome, dynamic, intelligent Andrea. Iota, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for taking time out of your day. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. All right, can everybody see the slides? Perfect, I'm gonna hide these meeting controls. All right, and we're good. Um, yeah, so as Nayota said, my name's Andrea Goulet. Um, and I wanted to start off just a little bit of my journey and kind of how I ended up in the strange kind of intersection between empathy and communication and then also technology. Um, so, my first career, I, I have a degree in marketing and uh, business communications, and my first 
job out of the gate was in sales. And it was funny because the way that they taught me how to sell was they gave me like a big stack of brochures. I was selling payroll services. And so they were like, oh, well, here's your little geographic region. Take your car and then knock on the businesses of door, like, and just give them a brochure and tell them what you do. And I noticed that like 99 times out of 100, the brochure that I gave them went into the circular file. It was just immediately tossed. And so I was like, this is not effective at all. So I was using a database. It was called ACT. It was a customer relationship management system. And it had a lot of customizable things that weren't obvious. So I went in and I built custom templates and then I had to add custom fields. And then I created cadences that were based on Boolean logic of like, how long had it been since I had talked to somebody and so then I was able to create highly, highly personalized letters because an example would be, I would say, I would capture the first, the place where I had met them. So, um, and like make a note of what we talked about. And those were fields. And so it would be like, hi, first name. It was great meeting you at the Herndon Chamber of Commerce. And I enjoyed our conversation about, you know, X, Y, and Z, but I could pull all that in really quickly. And so I just started automating things. And within six months, I had never sold before, but I became the number three rep in the nation. And people were like, what the heck are you doing? So they wanted me to present on all these things. Um, and so then I had a friend who came up to me and was like, you're actually doing something a little bit different than sales because all of the things you're doing are really geared on the letters. Like that's the driving force of that. So what you're doing is called copywriting, which is using the written word to persuade and motivate. And so I ended up uh, moving on and starting my own consultancy where I focused on copywriting and really, really loved it. It was doing great. And I had gotten a good job at a large organization, but I was kind of starting to get bored. And then in 2009, I reconnected with a friend from high school. And I had the whole time I was copywriting, I was writing a blog about you know, kind of how I thought about all of these sales things. And he came up to me and goes, I hate to tell you this, but you're really not a copywriter. You're not in sales. What you're doing is programming because you're taking inputs. Cause I would go to like, I had a goal where I would get 200 business cards a week. Right. And so I had to shake a lot of hands and meet a lot of people to get 200 business cards a week. So, and I would take all those inputs, I would put it through, I had all these, you know, things that it would run through, and then I would get output. Um, and he's like, that's programming. Like, I was like, oh, okay. And so he's like, I have a business that I want to start because I love fixing bugs. And I love using agile practices. But no one will let me fix bugs at my software companies. Everybody wants me to build new features. It's like, that's really weird. And the marketing training that I had had that the way that you succeed in business is to do something that everybody needs and no one else knows how or wants to do. And modernizing legacy seemed to fit that uh, model very nicely. So uh, joined forces with him, learned how to code. We're still running the business 13 years later. And then um, three years after we joined as business partners, we decided to become life partners too. So we got married. Now we have two kids. Just waiting for the uh, for the movie to come out on that one. So, And then now I'm kind of transitioning into this new phase of my career where it's about the learnings that we had from the... Because when I was learning how to do copywriting, like I had to learn very technical applications of empathy. Like you can't do that job unless you know these things. So we started experimenting with adding these things like writing commit messages and, um, you know, how do we use empathy while we're refactoring code? And it really made a difference. Like we were able to make traction on a lot of our clients where they told us that other people just couldn't. So now that, you know, at a decade later, it's like, okay, I think there's something here and we've seen enough patterns. And then uh, 
Katie, who is a longtime client of Corgi Bites, she and I have decided to join forces and make this a thing too. So I know that's a little bit of a backstory, but I've always thought that like, you know, my winding career kind of was a little odd in figuring out if I belonged. But I think that this in this conversation is really important. And I do think that the the place where I offer the value is that I have the domain understanding of both worlds. And I think that's where it's hard because people who really understand copywriting and sales and marketing and empathy, they struggle to use the concepts of like abstraction and decomposition and like some very key things that are in software. Um, and at the same time, working with so many software developers where it's like, how do I do this? And just really struggling to find that training. So what I would like to do now, that's my story. And so I'd love to have you tell your story a little bit. So you can do this in the chat. You can raise your hand and share on video if you would like. But, you know, tell us about a time maybe where you struggled to communicate some technical information, right? Maybe you had a project or an initiative where you saw that this would really make a difference, but you need to get budget for it or you need to get some kind of approval. And what happened? What was the outcome? How did that make you feel? Um, so it doesn't have to be super long, right? If you wanted to make it concise, but um, we'll spend a few minutes kind of chatting about what y'all's experiences are. And this will be very awkward if no one shares. <laughs> So Amanda said, not understanding what level of detail project managers are looking for when they ask questions. That's a good one. Yep, that's very common. Do you do people feel like they tend to present too much detail or not enough detail kind of as a habit or kind of just don't know what the right amount of detail is too much? Yeah, you are not alone. Yeah, I think I think I'm like Amanda. I want to tell you all the bits and all the backstory and the research and what I found and how we can use it for the greater good of this project. And I'm excited and I'm hype and I get a little too excited about all of the small things because I know those small things will make a great project. And they're like, um, nope, I don't even know what you're talking about. And I need you to uh, write that down in a memo. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. Um, yeah, we've got some great things coming in now. So um, so Stephanie said, or so Sam, uh, trying to make sure that the person making the decision understands the trade-offs involved. That's really good. So, and uh, the frameworks that we're going to be going over today, we're going to go over three frameworks because I love thinking in frameworks. And so these are things that you can just reply, you know, apply repeatedly based on your situation. Um, let's see here. We also have um, Stephanie. When I first entered tech, I was giving way too much detail because I didn't want to waste anything. That's really, that's really uh, something that I hear a lot. And then Richard, um, what information to share with senior developers when doing a code review? So then that way you can have a productive session. Yeah. Like what's, and I think that's the thing that everybody struggles with is like, what is the right level of information? Right. And so that's something that we'll go over. Um, Kayla says balancing, providing high level detail and being in the weeds and it depends on your audience. And sometimes you have multiple audiences. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So we're going to focus on that. Um, Katie says, communicating the deeply technical features of our software to our customers. And it's even more difficult with your potential customers. So yeah. And Ashley says, trying to explain something seemingly simple technical information to very non-technical users in a way that it's not condescending. It's also not too much. And finding that balance between what they need to know while also including the best practices to maximize the tech, but without getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah, I mean, all of this is, it's hard, right? Like this is, this gets just as technical as writing software. Like 
it, there are a lot of different things that you can do to manage all of these complexities. Um, Logan said, having a hard time conveying to other people that it's possible to have software that's easy to change and that specific techniques can help us get to a place that's better than how it is now. Oh, that is so, I, I feel you on that one, Logan. We, yeah, we run into that a lot. And then Paige says, engine explaining how and why to leverage containerization like Docker when recent grads of the boot camp um, to recent grads who maybe haven't used it or don't understand why. Very relevant. Um, and Logan says that's where he thinks the gap was. Um, Sam says that when he's teaching, right, what level of detail to give to people so that they really know and understand and how to give students actionable information without overwhelming them. And Sam and I actually had an offline, like we had a <laughs> DM conversation where we were talking about exactly that same thing. So that's something I'm personally struggle with too. Um, and then Jade said, recently joined tech company as a marketing manager. And the challenge is mostly trying to understand the development team when they explain the technical concepts that you need to share on social media. And I think that's something that people overlook. A lot of times the marketing team and the engineering team can be like the culture creates this almost like rivalry where it's like, oh, you're the business or you're the engineering team. And so that's where a lot of the empathy pieces can come in. And so, you know, Jade really you know, I can tell already that you're trying to understand, right? And and that is a process and it takes time. And the jargon is immense, immense. So so there's a lot there. Um, and then Ari says, the paradox of teaching and knowledge, the more you know about something, the harder it is to know what beginners don't know and how to teach it. Yep, we're going to touch on that a little bit. And talking to managers to figure out how to communicate why they should care about certain technical position. I mean, y'all just like wrote the whole presentation for me in this. So I think you are in the right place. Awesome. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I think I, I appreciate everybody taking the time to share because I hope that this, if nothing else, helps you show, helps you see that you're not alone. Like this is an objectively hard thing to do. And so if you're struggling with it, my First thing is always give yourself com some compassion. I see a lot of people just really beat themselves up that they don't have these skills or acquire these skills. But when the, the truth is, is that communication skills are vir vir virtually never taught if you have a degree in computer science. You very likely did not get this type of training. Um, it's only, only in 2014 did the IEEE include a lot of these communication training into what they need to teach a software development curriculum. So part of that is like when I was in my marketing class, I never learned how to code. And so me beating myself up and comparing myself to my partner who had been coding for 20 years and had a CS degree, like that was hard. So be kind to yourself and just recognize you're here, you're going to learn, and this is a learnable skill. All right. So let's look at um, some of the impediments. What are some of the things that get in the way of effective communication? And there are a lot, but I just, you know, limited it to four. So the first is the expert problem, which someone had mentioned. Um, and this is a real thing, right? So it, the more you know about a domain, it makes you harder to empathize and communicate with the people who have less domain knowledge because you can't remember a time when you didn't know it because it's been so ingrained. Um, and so, you know, wrecking, and so you might use terms that, you know, are a little bit more advanced. Um, and, you know, that can kind of sometimes cause people to feel like, oh, maybe I don't know enough. Um, a good example of this is, you know, Scott had come up to me at the high school reunion and, and he has graciously allowed me to share this in public. So, um, and, uh, he had told me that I was programming. I was like, awesome. So then we went and got some books on HTML and CSS. And I was like scoring through them. I was like, this is really cool. And I told him, I was like, I think I'm getting the hang of this programming thing. And he replied back and said, you're not programming. And my confidence just completely deflated. And I was like, I, I don't understand. Like you told me I was good at programming. And he was like, well, you're using declarative languages and you're not actually instantiating an, an event change. So that's that doesn't count as programming, but you are coding. 
And I was like, what the, what's, what's an instantiation? What's a, like, he just threw all these new terms at me. And so from his perspective, I had leveled up enough where he thought he could communicate with me on a level. And his intent was very much like, I see you as a peer and here, I want to help you grow. But the way that it landed to me was I'm stupid. If I don't even know what programming is, I'm never going to be successful. And these are some of the things that we see all the time happening where somebody sends an intent and it's good, but then it gets landed the wrong way. Um, and, that, and I think a lot of that exchange was the expert problem because he just assumed that I knew some of those terms, but with my limited coding ability, because the tool that I had used was very much just a WYSIWYG drag and drop kind of thing. So I didn't, I didn't know. Um, the next is content structure. And so I heard a lot of people talking about details and when to present them. And this falls into this bucket. So the way that we organize our communication, it, and the way that we present it, present it, it really impacts our ability to understand it. Um, one of the very first jobs I did, like I happened to be, I happened to start a job as a copywriter uh, at a very opportune time because this was in, um, so I had to work like when we started Cory Bytes, I was still copywriting on the side, but there was some legislation that came out from the government, the Plain Language Writing Act. And so I ended up having a lot of folks like from governments where it's like, I had to rewrite all of these government policies because it was now governmentally mandated that they were easy to understand. And so knowing which information to put where, you know, knowing how to make things accessible without having this feeling of oh, I'm dumbing things down, right? And that's something that I see a lot too, is that if you don't provide all the detail, then you're dumbing it down. But really what you're doing is you're synthesizing things and you're giving people kind of a breadcrumb trail to follow so that they can learn more. Another is semantic misalignment. Um, and so this is where the meaning of a word is interpreted differently, and that can lead to misunderstandings and communication confusion. So again, that term programming, like to Sky, it had more nuance than I had. I was like, I don't understand what the difference is between programming and coding. They're the same thing, right? And it's like, no, they're not. And we got into this like heated debate and uh, we see this all the time, right? Because And I'm still like, I'm like, what's an attribute and what's a property? And like, oh, I'm use and so I had a lot of anxiety of whether or not I'm using the tech terminology correctly, because I feel like that's something that people get called out on. So for people who don't code, there is a lot of anxiety around that. Um, and vice versa, because I think Scott as well, like when I started talking about marketing terms and you know, finance and business stuff. He was just like, oh, what, what is, what is all this stuff? You know, a ledger and a balance sheet and like, ah, I don't know. So it takes time to kind of be able to help each other. And that's where empathy and compassion can help. And then channel disruptions. So during a communication exchange, there are a lot of different failure points. Thank you, Ari. You still don't know the attribute and property. Thank you. I haven't been able to figure it out. And it's always nice when other people say that. Um, and then, uh, so channel disruptions, right? So if you get, you know, let's say that you're having a really good heart to heart, but then your phone rings, you know, and, and something happens or like you just, something trips you up emotionally. So this is what happened with me and Scott, where I just got really defensive. And then that strained our ability to have a good conversation. So there are times where just the environmental circumstances of the situation can make it hard, right? Like if you're going to a concert and everything's like really loud, it's gonna be really hard to have like a nuanced and like really sensitive conversation. So those are things you need to um, pay attention to. Yeah, so the channel disruptions, they're kind of like context, but they are um, anything that just kind of interrupts or um, like you can think of it as like static on a television. We'll go over this in just a little bit. Um, but like noise in a system that that just prevents that signal com from coming through clearly. And there can be a ton of them. Some of them you know, some of them you don't, right? Like if somebody just had a really bad day and then they're taking it out on you and so you assume it's you, right? Like those are all kind of different disruptions. So really what it comes down to is the thing that I see a lot is um, are you telling 
knowledge. Like this is this is where I see a lot of people who have a ton of deep domain expertise. This is like their natural place. This is where they want to go. Um, so another opportunity that I had, which was really cool, was I worked with the Smithsonian. I got brought in on a project when the Smithsonian was doing their rebranding. And so they flew in 50 of like the top scientists in the world. And I got to do a workshop with them. And it was so, so cool. Um, but I sat down for lunch and I heard this really interesting conversation between an astrophysicist and a uh, biologist who studies birds. Or, you know, thought, I can't remember even the terminology of his specialization. I apologize. And the way they were talking, it was like they were just kind of being cordial and like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. So like the the person who was studying the birds was like, let me tell you all about the migration patterns of an austral bird species in South America and started using all of these different, like really specific terminology things. And I couldn't follow it. And so then, you know, the physicist turn was, oh, let me tell you all about the gravitational waves around binary dwarf stars and started using all these different terminologies. And so I, I um, was like, I'm sorry, I'm not a scientist, but I'm really curious about what you're saying. Could, could you help me understand uh, what your work is? And because these were such trained professors, like scientists, they focus a lot on science communication. So what they did was in the moment, they were able to transform that knowledge because they recognized the, um, you know, they recognized who I was and kind of didn't have the same background. And so the, the person who studies birds said, oh, well, the migration patterns of birds in very specific regions of South America, it's helping us learn how climate is changing. I was like, oh, that's really important. I didn't know you could do that from studying a single species of birds in South America. That's, wow, that's important. And then the astrophysicists were like, yeah, and the gravity changes that we're seeing around certain star systems, they're helping us identify new planets. I was like, what? We're doing that? And so then it was, then I had the opportunity to ask for more detail. Like, how are you doing that? How does that work? But that ability to kind of transform the telling into transforming because you understand your audience, that's really the key to all of this. So if you, if you kind of get nothing else out of this, thinking about who your audience is and being able to adapt your message to your audience, and you're still talking about the same thing, but again, it's like, what's the impact? Like what's, what's going to make sense for me? And what's the, um, what's the thing that's going to really encourage the conversation to progress? So here are some common anti-patterns that I see. Um, and a lot of them we have seen in the, in the chat. Um, so one that I see is highlighting the value, hiding what the highlighting what you value and ignoring what other people value. Right. I see this a lot with um, you know, trying to describe. So I'll give you another story. So when Scott and I first started our um company, one of the very first clients that we had, it was to help them modernize their legacy code. Um, and Scott at the check-in, you know, the our client was kind of like, I don't understand what you're doing. And he got really excited because he was like, I increased your test coverage from 1.5 to 2%. And like, he was super excited and like had built his whole presentation around it. And our client goes, I literally don't care. That makes no sense to me. And it makes me th think that you have done no work. And like, we were like, ah. So being able to identify what does your client care about or what does your manager care about or what whoever the person that you're talking to being able to frame your you know work in that way or your idea in that way you know that's going to help you build rapport so that you can have a good conversation um, leading with the details of an implementation instead of describing the benefits which is the why it's important using jargon instead of plain language we touched on that a bit Failing to plan for ways that communication could break down. Like the way I think of this is that we've got our happy path, right? With empathy and communication. We also have a lot of different corner cases and edge cases, right? And, and like same thing we do in development, like we don't just code for the happy path. We don't just assume everything is going to be perfect all the time, right? Paying attention to how things go wrong is actually how we do a lot of things right. Same thing applies here. Um, 
Another is mentalizing the content for a large group instead of thinking about an individual who will be um, consuming your content. And as we mentioned, there can be multiple audiences. So sometimes this is hard, but you can't have empathy for a group. Like you can't create an emotional connection and like really identify. And so that's a blocker that you're actually putting an impediment in your place. So being able to uh, focus on one person who might be kind of an archetypal representative of the larger group in thinking about like, okay, how is the work that I'm, you know, writing going to be perceived to them? And then you can kind of come out and fill out if there's any edge cases, but Thinking about one person instead of a group is also important. Um, another thing I see is the way that we structure content. People who really, really like the details, I often see like, it looks like a novel. It's just like prose, like paragraph and paragraph and paragraph. So being able to use visual elements, so headings, subheads, like think in H1s and H2s, right? Same way that we would do this, like what's an unordered list? What's an ordered list? you know, putting things in boxes, like those help so much, especially for people who aren't familiar, because we don't often read, um, especially for people who are more like their role is making decisions constantly. Um, they don't read as much. They um, focus on scanning and um, believing that effective communication isn't part of your job, right? So if you're a developer and you're like, that's not my job, that's marketing's job. I don't have to communicate effectively, right? Uh, you're going to have a struggle selling your ideas, right? Effective communication is part of is any role. Um, another is feeling like any type of persuasive writing is sleazy and gross. So, and with that, I'm just going to touch briefly on what I think of as ethical copywriting, right? Because with ethical writing, we're working to influence, but then we're crosses the line is where we move into manipulation. Um, so influence is thinking about your audience. How might it be perceived? But manipulation is just creating the content in haste and like not really caring about how other people are going to think about it. Um, ethical is more like creating content that's rooted in compassion and that you focus on the people that you're going to be writing to are people. There's a humanity. Um, another thing that I see, which is why I think that people in tech tend to just shy away from this type of writing altogether is that a lot of people have been trained to code to make the compiler happy. But when we only think of the machine or if we only code to make an algorithm work, then we're losing that human connection. And that can, that can lead us to make choices that err more on the side of manipulation very easily. Um, autonomy is super, super huge. So if you throughout the process, allow people to walk away with no stress and like totally get it right. Your product has to speak for itself. Um, but there are a lot of different marketers out there who use tactics that create this really heightened sense of emotion. Like think about like an urgency. And this is where that used car, it's like, oh, you're pressuring me to make a decision. And they're doing that on purpose because then that way the discomfort of just getting out of the transaction uh, is less painful than parting with your money. So uh, not everyone does that on purpose, right? But there are some people who do. Um, keeping people with specific individuals in mind. Um, if you use descriptive and associative terms like users or the business. Again, that's a specific type of literary technique called metonymy. But what it does is again, it's like dehumanizing a whole group of people. And so you're just stereotyping the business instead of getting to know the humans that are working in the business department. Um, and then also it comes down to research. So if you're conducting quality research that is based on actual experiences, right? versus relying on assumptions and stereotypes and bias and just, you know, kind of not looking to learn anything. So at the end of the day, all of this is about what's in it for me. And so this is a sales, I have a radio on here because this is a sales thing that I saw where it's like, what's in it for me, right? That's the W-I-I-F-M. And no one listens to radio anymore, but they did 20 years ago. It's like, that's the only radio station that anybody listens to. What's in it for me? All right. Um, in terms of audiences, these are some 
effective ones to keep in mind while you're, you know, especially if you're trying to sell an idea internally in an organization, this isn't the only audiences, but doing some kind like this is an audience analysis. This is something that like I would do is sit down and figure out where the gaps are. So the key stakeholders, like what are the benefits to them and what are the costs, right? Um, how are they going to make decisions? Um, what do they think are credible sources? What's their existing knowledge on the subject? You know, what are their like core beliefs that, you know, I need to know about in order to, um, to write effectively? What kind of shared goals do we have so that I can, you know, lead with those? Oh yes, you're going to have access to all the slides. So, um, what kind of level of trust do we have? What kind of possible objections are they going to have right out the gate? And how can I plan for that? Um, do they have any personal traits that like, you know, I need to know about? Like maybe they don't show a lot of emotion during, a, you know, they're really hard to read. And so that can, you know, be something that just you keep in mind. So then that way, when they are the way that they are, you don't take it personally that it was your content. And then what's the likely context? Are you going to be giving this in a large group? Is it a small room in a one-on-one? -on -one? So thinking about what that context is going to be. So some key audiences are, you know, the key stakeholders. So these are the people who are the most influential. You know, it, it can be anyone on a project, but a lot of times like in a large organization, it's like the CEO or the department lead or, you know, people like that. Um, gatekeepers. So who's somebody who can block or advance your idea? You know, it's important to keep them in mind. Um, who controls the budget? <laughs> That's important. So being able to write with the person in whose mind is oriented towards, are we going to get a return on investment? And a lot of times, if you can construct your content to demonstrate that it's a good use of funds, that's a, that's a huge win. Um, advisors, so is there anybody who's lending influence? And then implementers, so who are the people who are going to actually make this a reality? There are a few other audiences to consider. So phantom readers, so these are people who are not your intended audience, but might interact with your content. So these are things like media outlets or the general public, or, you know, it might get brought up to an executive. So, you know, I know that media is, again, really uh, biased these days, but what I learned, um, in the, you know, in my training was never write anything that you don't want to appear on the front page of the New York times. Right. And so just keeping that in mind as a way to kind of motivate you to double check your work. Right. And think about it. Future readers. So this is important in software, right? Like the documentation or the commit messages and the artifacts that we're leaving behind. They might be useful to somebody who is hired three years from now that we never even meet. And then complex audiences. So there are times when there are multiple audiences. And so being able to have flexible thinking where you can integrate all of those together. So we are going to really quickly, because I think time, I want to be careful of time. Um, and so we're going to go through these different strategies really quickly so that you guys can get into your groups because I thought that I was on time and I was not. Um, so, the, so we've got three different ones. So we've got ADA. So this is based on a sales framework. And this is great when you have an idea and you need to pitch it to a lot of people and you don't exactly know who the person who's gonna like run with it is gonna be. Um, then we have Sapata, which is a much lesser well-known one. Um, and this is a really good framework for getting buy-in on a specific initiative. So if you're giving a pitch or something within your organization, this is really good. And then we have the Shan Shannon Weaver model. Um, and so this is effective for interpersonal relationships. All right. So framework number one. Um, ADA. So we've got a um, kind of decision tree. So we've got a funnel here. So this is a lot of times called the sales funnel. Um, the original one just talks about awareness, interest, decision, action in terms of the decision phase. But as I learned about all the copywriting elements, I was like, they actually kind of match up. So, you know, the matchup of these things is kind of how I think of it. Um, so awareness is just like, I need to capture attention, right? Like that is the thing that we are so, that is such a scarce resource. So having a tagline that's easy to say and presents the core of an idea, that's called a hook, right? And that's something that just goes, oh, okay, you exist, right? <laughs> 
So next is interest, right? And in, and in each phase, what we're trying to do is to get the copy and get the writing to just get somebody to move into the next phase. And not everyone will, right? Interest is where the curiosity is kind of peaked. Like, okay, I'll check out your website. Okay, I'll give you five minutes. Okay, walk with me in the elevator. Tell me, right? And so here, the most important thing to talk about are the benefits, like what's in it for me, right? That radio station. Um, and then you can talk about the details later. So you're not hiding it. You're not dumbing it down. You're getting people's buy-in so that they are in a place where they can listen and really absorb all of those details. So next is decision. This is where people look at the details. They start to weigh it against alternatives. They look at budget and they're really trying to assess is this a good time? Is this a good project? Is this the thing we want to do? So this is where we start to talk about features. And the features are the things that back up the benefit statements. They often have, you know, detail and specifics. So an example would be like, my computer is really fast, right? You get fast performance versus like, I have a, you know, 64 core, um, you know, processor. And so it's like, I don't even know if that's a thing. I'm sorry. Like, I feel really overwhelmed and like worried. This is one of those places where I'm like, ah, I didn't use precise language and now I feel vulnerable, but that's okay. Um, but, but talking about like, this is the actual thing that it is rather than like, this is why you're going to like it. Um, and then finally the action, the call to action. So that's direct language. It tells people what to do. Here's how we get started, right? Um, Here's just an example. I'm going to not go through this right now, but this is kind of the Corgi Bytes branding and kind of how we, you know, have used this to think through. So like, you know, we've got a hook, we've got benefits on our websites, you know, we've, we hit features, right? And then we've got a call to action. All right. So the next framework is called Sopata, right? And there's kind of a full framework and then there's a shortened framework. And in this one, this is great for any type of persuasive writing. Um, so it doesn't have to just be for work, but it's about like, how do I get an idea funded or how do I get an idea like implemented? So the first is the subject. So that's kind of like a short title. Then the objective, what do we want to achieve? Like what's, what, do, what is the outcome we're going for? Present situation. So like, what's the current context, your proposal, here's what I think we should do. And these are kind of in bullets. It's not super long. You should be able to put this on kind of like one or at most two pages, the advantages. So as Sam was talking about, like the pros and cons, you, you want to present that. Um, and it gives you credibility that like, oh, you've thought through this. You're not just like throwing things, you know, willy nilly and then action. So, okay, here's the next step that we need to do. And that makes it really easy for somebody who needs to digest information, like how to help them make a decision and it can be easier when it's like, here's the next small thing that we need to do to try to get this idea rolling or to experiment. And then you can do a shortened framework, which is SPRA, not as easy to say, but here's what's going on. Here's what we should do. Here's why we should do it. And here's how we get started. So, um, and then here's another example. So this is an internal project that we pitched um, at doing at Corgi Bytes, where we wanted to augment some of our consulting with internal projects. Uh, uh, building an internal product. And that's like a big decision. So, you know, here's kind of how we walked through that. And then the last one is the Shannon Weaver model of a general communication system. And some of you may find this to be uh, familiar because Shannon Weaver, uh, so Claude Shannon was the person who actually uh, coined the term bit. And he was the person who was like, you know what? We could test digital systems by, uh, you know, using this thing called Boolean algebra, right? And so before you had to manually test all these things. So this was in the 30s. Um, so in 1962, after the war, he had worked on cartography. And so he was employed by Bell Labs. And it was like, how do you get a piece of information from an information source to a destination as clearly as possible? And so there's a lot of math behind this. Um, and Warren Weaver was a um, government administrator who saw the potential of this and said, it can be used for much more things. So I was really surprised when I got to computer science and then saw this because I was like, that's what I saw in all my marketing <laughs> courses. Um, 
So this is something that if you're familiar with it, you already know. Um, and then also we have this adapted to people systems. So you have an information channel, but we've also added a relationship channel. So in addition to thinking about just the content, you're also looking at the, um, you know, how, how is my relationship with this person? So you're thinking about feelings and how things are going to land. And with this, you're looking at the different failure points. These are the edge cases and trying to solve for them as best you can. So I had done my best to get it short, but uh, yeah, I struggled too. So yeah, so now it's time to practice. So uh, we can do kind of a much shorter uh, readout. Um, but yeah, the idea is that, you know, get into groups, think about a situation. It can be hypothetical or it can be real, um, but one scenario that you're going to work on as a team and think about your audience. So pick one, pick one primary audience right now. And remember, it's easier if you're thinking about a specific person. And then pick one of these communication frameworks. And then Katie, if you can share the link to the slides so that you have all these juicy details. Um, yeah, I've got the link to the slide here. And then um, we had a couple of people pop out that aren't able to do the workshop. So I just wanna make sure we have three or four people yep. in each of these groups. Oh, I think you sent that to just me. Oh, sorry, Andrea. Let me do everyone in meeting. There we go. So there are the slides. There Bye, and Ashley. And let's see, everybody's got three or four people in their groups. And um, Andrea will be, oh, we gotta hold on. Move two. I don't wanna leave you guys alone in a room. So there we go. I think we're good. All right, I'm going to open all the rooms. I will resend the um, link to each of your chats in the room as well, because the chat box might go away. And we should be good to go. All right, if you guys have any questions, um, you'll be able to send a, a chat to me and I'll be able to see it. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I ran over. Well, that's okay. So I'm looking at this right now and it looks like we still have six people that are haven't joined the rooms yet. Okay. And there is one room with only two people. I haven't joined the room. <laughs> Nyota, do you want to go join a room to fill the, the two people room? Can I sign you to a, a room with only two people? Yes, you do, Nyota. You will be amazing in there. I wanted to, to uh, what I wanted to say, and I don't know if, if it's, you know, one of the things I was concerned about, cause you know, the program I was telling you about Katie is that I'm, it's a, it's a computer science um, program and that's not my jam. Right. And so I was like, I wanted to, I basically wanted to, I just basically wanted to get some free coaching, but there you go. <laughs> but I can. I can slide it, over. Uh -huh. It's okay. I think I might just mention in here. I think I think the rooms with just two people are fine. I think so. Yeah. And it looks like a bunch of people popped out. Oh man. We popped out. I wanted to stay in. Um because you could consolidate, put right the Yeah, but they're probably already talking at this point. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you just snatch them out the room. Yeah, and they'll be like, where am I going? Yeah. So um it's okay. We've got as long as there's even two people, it's great. Um, yeah. I don't know that I'm able to see, oh, break out rooms. There we go. Okay. So the only unassigned are you two, Andrea and Iota. Yeah. And Keep then, me unassigned so that I can yeah. jump through. And then Carmen and that's it are haven't joined. So we're, we're pretty good. Um, <laughs> So Andrea, maybe if you can pop into room two first, since there's only two people in there, mm -hmm. uh, but although Sam is in there, so I'm sure it's fine. Um, mm -hmm. That would be useful. Oh, and room four also has two people. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe pop in give, there first. I'm going to give it just a few minutes so everybody can like get to know each other a little bit. Yeah. So I'm feeling Richard, right? Or I, I really like his his energy. Like he really seems like no, just very inquisitive. Like I like. I, I think like we just that. joined the Discord. Yeah. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we can really, we really see like, oh, hold on. Let me pause recording. Yeah. Recorded. Let's see here. Yeah. Hang on, just one second. All right. I will just not share. Oh, did I move something? Your screen share is loading. Sorry, I've got two different screens. All right, I'm just gonna share and you all see the uh, PDF. So and that will be one of the things that when I worked in advertising was, it's not just good, it's good enough. So. All right, Bye. so let's see if that makes it bigger. Um, yeah, so here are just some of the prompts that I had to just kind of chat. So again, kind of feel free to post this in the chat um, or to um, you know share in you know raise your hand and share um, towards the larger group. There are. There are a lot of different ways, but just kind of thinking about like, what was this like? And did anything surprise you? Um, did you have a big takeaway? And you don't have to answer all of these. These are just prompts. Um, but yeah, just thinking about how might you use these ideas, you know, in, in your work. I felt like the prompts for putting these into a, you know, the prompts for getting it into that format actually were a good way of thinking through the problem as well. Like it helped us come up with ideas. Okay, good. I guess uh, my most enjoyable experience was seeing the faces of other people interested in bringing empathy into technology, being able to see, okay, I'm not alone. There's other people, there's a community is something I am grateful for. Oh, good. Yeah, there's a lot of people who uh, who really wanna make a change. And I think that's something we hear very consistently at these events and yeah, you're not alone. There's a lot of people who are, who are excited about making the tech world more compassionate, so. Glad you're here. Hannah said that it was nice to get familiar with frameworks for discussing problems, especially seeing where I sort of use these already, but you didn't have a word for it. Good. Sometimes just knowing that like there's a there's like a concrete thing like can help you feel less of a like, oh, I'm just operating off of intuition. I don't know. Is this really going to work? Um, and then it's like, no. Someone has researched this. Yes. <laughs> like, I know I always feel more comfortable there. And Amanda said, putting words to communication breakdown points is so important. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that there's three different opportunities where you're like, you have like your persuasive style or you have communicating externally or you have communicating across departments. Um, I actually am, we're redoing our branding and style guide right now at, at camera bits. And I might put some of this in, like use these frameworks when you're building out communication around technical writing and stuff. Cause our customers are savvy, but sometimes we think they're more savvy than they are. And like, so we need to be able to accommodate for a very like wide swath of technical capabilities. And this would be incredibly helpful just to have this like framework. And like, um, I believe Logan said, like, um, having the guidelines in place will actually help you better, like, 
express and like, you know, work through the problem. Whereas if you're just sort of organically doing it on a brainstorm, it's not as useful. Yeah. My dad likes to joke because, so he learned Zapata at like an IBM conference in the early eighties. And when I went to look it up, it's not something that's typically used, but he told me that anytime, like I struggled with an English paper or something that he would go through that framework for me. And he's like, well, yeah, that's why you just became a really good writer and really persuasive and why you felt it was easy because you've been learning this framework since you were eight. Like I was like, huh? So, you know, it's really interesting how just knowing some of these things, they eventually become just ingrained practices. And then you don't have to go through the like formal piece of it. It just becomes kind of part of your habits. So, but yeah, I was like, trying to find a source I could cite. And he was like, well, just say that I took this course. And I was like, dad, that's not going to work for a research paper. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So the Zapata one is the one that you will find the least amount in. Um, but yeah. Um, I just want to give a three minute warning until we're uh, done with the event. And we oftentimes stick around and just kind of chat. So if you have the ability to stick around and you want to stick around, we'll be here. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I just want to make sure anybody else says what they want to say, but also respect everybody's time. Yep. And then I think just the last thing is that if y'all want to get in touch with me, uh, here is how to do that. Um, so there's four, Ooh, my video just did this weird thing. Um, so there's four different places. So hardware.dev, that's the, um, company Katie and I work on you know, that we just founded last year. So that's empathy training, speaking and book updates. Um, Corgi Bytes is if you have software and you like having it remodeled, um, if you like mending software in general, legacycode.rocks is a great community to go there. And we have, um, uh, we have a podcast there too. And then our community for compassionate technologists is empathy and tech. We have a discord channel that I've been personally trying to get better at. Um, so we, we've got some great conversations there and, you know, people are starting to come in and volunteer. It's becoming a lot more vibrant and fun. So, um, yeah. And then Katie just posted to the feedback form that helps us so, so much because we really want to make sure that, um, these events are meeting your needs. Part of the feedback I had gotten from the past few ones was that I put way too much detail in and it's just, and it's hard to follow. So I tried to shut, I tried to slow this one down. Um, but if it was still too fast, let me know. So we read that. So. All right. Anything if, um, well, let me, oh, we have more found. Yep. So Nicholas said, found a lot of value in working through and trying to identify and understand communication expectations of a different group of specialists within our company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw with the scientists. It's like both of them are specialists, but then you can still talk past each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And how to reframe information delivery to meet some of that ex expectations. Yeah. And it's like, it's just that flexible thinking, right? Being able to look at things from different sides. So Oh, and Mary, you couldn't hear the first 20 minutes. So, but we'll have the recording. Mm -hmm. So you can go back and listen to that. And I think a lot of that was us just being like, hi, welcome. So, and we do, I'll be sending out a follow-up email that will include um, the link to the slides. And I also download it as a PDF for those who are struggling to access it. Um, the link to the feedback form will be in there. And then the link to our YouTube channel where um, once I've done some editing, we'll be able to put, we'll put the YouTube uh, the recording of this up on our YouTube, our empathy and tech, um, awesome. YouTube channel. Sorry. I was trying to read and talk at the same time. Some I days like I can multitask. Some days. I can <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, we'll just, we'll wrap this up really quickly. Um, thank you. Don't do not forget that the survey form, like, like Andrea said, it's super important for us to be able to update how we deliver content. Um, you know, how you all want to receive and so it's very important that you fill out that form just so we can just because that's part of being empathetic we care about uh this community we care about you so um help us to better serve you all and that form really does help 
Um, and so thank you so much for attending this workshop today. Um, if you are not part of the Empathy and Tech community, please find us um, on Discord, join us, um, communicate with us. You don't have to wait until we have these events. Um, and if you want more information, it can be found at empathyandtech.com, empathyandtech.com. Um, Andrea has already put all of the ways to reach out to her. And like Katie said, you'll get this information in the email. If you registered, you'll be able to find this after some cleanup and dusting on YouTube. And Andrea, do you have anything else to add? I know you I just, you got no, some. just. Y'all are awesome. <clears throat> and I just love that these events are so vibrant and it feels like a community and it feels like, you know, I think like you said, Richard, it's just like, it's nice to connect with people who are really in this and really care and really want to get better. So, and that's the thing that keeps me motivated. And I'm just so grateful to meet so many other people. So, yeah. Yeah, I know um, Andrea was considering, you know, turning this into, you know, not just this, but she has some courses where you can kind yeah. of, this, you know, build these skills for yourself. Andrea, do you want to share, you know, something? Um, yeah, I mean, so Katie and I are working on our self-paced courses for hardware. We were going to do some live events that kind of ended up being hard because the way we had structured it was hard for people to take that much time off. Um, so we're going to turn them into self-paced courses. The first one is an introduction to technical empathy, um, where I kind of describe empathy. I've got some frameworks there. Um, next we have, and I think this will probably be our next one. And then in the meantime, I think Katie and I like might talk, we might do a day long of this. So then we really get a lot of time. That was one of the things I noticed is that people wanted more time. So we'll, we'll see and see how that goes, but yeah. All sorts of good stuff going on. Right. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we're going to um, stop recording. If you guys want to hang out after you have some questions that you, you wanted to ask, um, we just kind of hang out after. So again, thank you so much for joining and have an amazing day. Yeah. Thank you awesome. so much. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>